A uh, Hulk Hogan, wrestling legend, icon of the business, and a man who's told quite a few lies. Before getting into this one, I think it's important to point out that Hollywood Hogan isn't the first wrestler to tell lies or embellish the truth. The wrestling business itself, at its very core, was built on fabrications to those willing to buy a ticket, and it's always been about perception. Perception is reality, pal. While we, as fans, are happy to open our arms to some good old deception, and while today wrestlers make it clear that, hey, this is my wrestling character and this is me in real life, some guys just seem to work the gimmick every day of their lives and the fabrications continue when the cameras stop. Hulk Hogan, quite simply, has told loads of porky pies throughout his time in the business and beyond, with some of his fairy tales being so ridiculous that they become funny. Make no mistake about it, Hogan tells lies that dupe the fans, there isn't a little wink here and a god your brother afterwards. Hulk talks absolute nonsense sometimes and he expects the most gullible of fans to believe his misleading stories of grandeur. Let's take a look at some of the things Hogan said over the years in today's video and you can be the judge. You can decide for yourself if old Thunderlips was telling the truth or if he was working the gimmick. Now, in fairness to Hulk Hogan, people have made up lies about Hulk Hogan telling lies. For example, a big one we hear a lot is that Hogan said in his WWE published autobiography that Elvis Presley was a Hulkamaniac even though Elvis had died two years after Hogan began working in Memphis. Well, that statement simply isn't made in the entire book and yes, unfortunately, I've read the entire book. Elvis is mentioned as in Jerry Lawler was his popular as Elvis at times, but not once does Hogan say Elvis was a fan of his work. So there are fabrications about Hogan's fabrications out there, everyone runs with them for the sake of clicks and hey, if someone wants to prove me wrong then let me know the page number. Everything in this video has been verified from Hogan interviews and his two books, one published by WWE and the other, My Life Outside the Ring, brought to us by Eric Bischoff LLC. And yeah, I know, a WWE book's gonna be filled with nonsense anyway and the second book is bound to contradict the first, but it's still content that's been published, unlike the Elvis story that everyone runs with. Alright, so the first one I want to bring up is Hogan vs Andre at WrestleMania. In Hogan's second book, he said that Andre weighed nearly 700 pounds at WrestleMania 3, and when Hogan picked him up for the body slam, he tore all the muscles in his back, all of them. He then said he had no time to recover because he had to go straight to Japan to wrestle for 29 straight nights, all this while every single muscle in his back was torn to shreds. The thing is though, well he didn't. There are absolutely no records of Hulk Hogan wrestling in Japan immediately after WrestleMania 3. He did eventually go back to Japan but that was in 1993 when he faced the great Muda at wrestling Don Taku. So yeah, there's three lies already. Andre wasn't pushing near 700 pounds, Hulk didn't tear the muscles in his back and he didn't go to Japan immediately after WrestleMania 3. This next one's a contradiction Hogan made between his two books. In the first, he said he trained to become a wrestler for over a year before getting smartened up to the business. He didn't learn that wrestling was choreographed until he took one year of brutal training. In Hollywood Hogan, published by WWE, Hulk said, in wrestling terms, it was a work and not a shoot. A shoot means you're really trying to hurt somebody. A work means you're working with a guy, dancing with him. Eddie Graham told me wrestling was a work. I was in shock, brother, total shock. I felt like I'd been betrayed. For the last year, I'd been getting the crop beat out of me, learning how to hurt people and keep from getting hurt myself. In the second book, Hogan changed his story when he said, so I was at this match one day with a seat close to the ring, watching Bob Orton do his thing. He's on top of this other wrestler and getting ready to pummel him, and I read Bob Orton's lips plain as day. Hit me. All of a sudden, the guy reaches up and hits him. I went, what? Had I really just seen that? I kept my eyes glued to Orton's mouth until it happened a second time. Hit me again, he said, and the guy hit him again. After all this time, nobody ever smartened me up to the notion that wrestling was fake, let alone that the ending of the match was predetermined. Even as kids, we all had moments where we wondered about it. It seemed like common sense that if I'm beating some guy up and I throw him against the ropes, I'm not gonna just stand there and let him bounce off the ropes and come back and knock me over, right? Why did they do stuff like that? But I'd never seen anything as clear as this. 
This is one where you'd dismiss what was said in the WWE published book for two reasons. One, it's a WWE published book. And two, it's a bit hard to believe that someone would train to be a pro wrestler for a whole year before learning it was all predetermined. I'm sure you've heard this one, but it just has to be included in this video. Hulk said he was asked to play bass in Metallica. Yeah, in an, in an interview with the Sun newspaper, Hogan said, I used to be a session musician before I was a wrestler. I played bass guitar. I was big pals with Lars Ulrich, and he asked me if I wanted to play bass with Metallica in their early days, but it didn't work out. Lars said he had never met Hulk Hogan and the Hulkster was full of it, so naturally, Hollywood Hogan changed this whole story when confronted about Lars' response. Hogan said in an interview with Noisy, I heard that Metallica needed a bass player, and brother, I was writing letters, made a tape of myself playing and sent it to their management company, kept making calls, trying to get through. I tried for two weeks and never heard a word back from them either. I was hoping for a call from them, but never got one. All the haters were like, you never auditioned for Metallica. Of course I didn't, but I tried. That's quite the jump from I'm good pals with Lars Ulrich to of course I didn't audition for Metallica. James Hetfield said Hogan did not audition for the group and he didn't know anything about Hogan getting invited to play bass, but he did say, jokingly, that Hogan would make a good fit for the band. He would make all the other guys in Metallica look very small. WWF SummerSlam 1992 was held in the United Kingdom, but Hulk Hogan was not part of the show. After WrestleMania 8, Hogan disappeared from WWF TV screens and he wouldn't return until early 1993. That didn't stop Hogan from claiming in his first autobiography that he met a Make-A-Wish kid with cancer before the big show in Wembley Stadium. Hulk said the kid was supposed to be sitting at ringside while he wrestled his match in London, but Hulk didn't see him anywhere. Hogan said he went backstage and he wanted to know where the kid was and he was told that the youngster had passed away just before Hogan got in the ring. And this complete tale of make-belief inspired a track on the Hulk Rules album by Hulk Hogan and the Wrestling Boot Band, released in 1995. The song was called Hulkster in Heaven and the profits went to that little kid who passed away. But Hulk Hogan did not compete at SummerSlam 1992 in Wembley Stadium, and I would sincerely hope he got the dates and the show mixed up with something else. To be fair, Hogan wrestled in Wembley Arena with WCW in 1994, so maybe that's where Hogan met the little kid? I really hope that's the case. Hulk Hogan said he had the opportunity to get involved with UFC during the early days of the company and we assumed this was in a competitive role. Hulk said in an interview with the Herald Sun in Australia that he was turned off by the MMA organization due to referees not stopping fights when they were supposed to and the referees letting guys get beat up when it wasn't necessary. This was completely debunked when Hogan's interview was brought to the attention of UFC co-founder Campbell McLaren. Campbell said he never wanted Hogan in UFC, Hogan didn't have just discussions with anyone within UFC, and even Joe Rogan got in on the action when he said on Twitter, Campbell, if you're really disputing a statement made by a flamboyant, entertaining pro wrestler, you've already lost. Could you imagine Hulk Hogan in the octagon though, slugging it out in a real fight? I don't know, I think that's something I'd actually pay to see. When The Undertaker tombstoned Hulk Hogan at Survivor Series 1991 to win the WWF Championship, Hulk told Taker that the dead man seriously hurt him. He even repeated this in the first autobiography, but to Hulk's credit, he also says in the book that Taker took care of him when performing the move and it wasn't his fault. Still, The Undertaker was guilt-ridden, and the Phenom explained in an ESPN interview that not only did he promise Hogan he wouldn't hurt him in the match, seeing as Hogan told him earlier that his neck wasn't 100%, but Taker also said there was absolutely Absolutely no way he could have hurt Hogan due to how safely he performed the move. Taker goes backstage after the Survivor Series match. He finds Hogan lying on Vince's office floor. Paramedics come in. Hogan wants to talk to his wife and kids on the phone. And Taker thinks he's done. He's just hurt the Golden Goose. 
It wasn't until Taker arrived at this Tuesday in Texas when he saw a replay of the move and everybody agreed. From The Undertaker himself to the boys in the back, there was no way Hogan could have got injured that badly from the tombstone at Survivor Series. At this Tuesday in Texas, Taker and Hogan were booked for a rematch and Taker said he was really paranoid about the main event showdown. He was concerned about his future, so he approached Hogan and he told him straight up that he watched the tombstone again and Hogan was kept safe. Hogan said, <laughs> Hogan said, because Taker was holding him so tight he couldn't move, and quote, I couldn't move my neck at all, and the fact that The Undertaker was being overly safe is why Hogan got hurt. Taker said in the ESPN interview that that was all he needed to understand what Hogan was all about. Taker didn't hold a grudge, he respected what Hogan did for the wrestling business, but he wasn't friends with Hogan following this Tuesday in Texas. Hogan said the original script for No Holds Barred was so brutal that he and Vince got a hotel room, they sat in that hotel room for 3 days, 24 hours a day, and they rewrote the whole film. He and Vince couldn't come up with the final fight scene, so Hogan went to take a dump while he was delirious from sitting up for hours listening to Vince McMahon trying to write a movie. While sitting on the toilet, he closed his eyes, he began daydreaming, and the whole fight scene played out in his head while he was drifting off. Keep in mind, this all happened while turds were flying out of Hogan's backside. Hogan then jumped up from the can, he shouted, I got it, I got it. He ran out of the bathroom and he told Vince to ride as fast as he could. Hulk told Vince how it was going to end while trying his best not to fall asleep again, and that's how the magnificent movie known as No Holds Barred came to be. This whole story can be found in Hogan's first autobiography. In an interview with WFAN in New York back in 2011, Hulk Hogan said he wrestled a lot of pride fighters in Japan starting in 1977, and he wouldn't know if he was getting in the ring with a worker or a shooter. The thing is, the pride promotion officially launched in 1997, some 20 years later. Now, to play devil's advocate in this one, Hogan could have wrestled guys who would go on to fight in the pride promotion years later, and maybe Hogan's choice of words caused this mix-up. I'm trying to give him as much leeway as I can here, but the way Hogan said it doesn't sound good at all. In the same interview, Hogan also said he told Vince McMahon to change the date of WrestleMania 3 because the Rolling Stones played the Silverdome the week before. I'm not sure about this to be honest and some Stones fans might be able to confirm, but a quick Google search shows that the Stones only played in the Silverdome in 1981 and 1989. WrestleMania 3 was held in 1987. U2 played the venue the month after WrestleMania 3, but the Rolling Stones were nowhere to be found. A very straightforward lie here and one of Hogan's most famous. On the Arsenio Hall show, Hulk Hogan said he wasn't on the juice and he didn't abuse Roy's brother, going as far as to show a picture of himself at 10 years old supposedly to prove he was always big. Kinda funny how there's other 10 year olds here as big as the coach, but yeah, prime Hulk Hogan nonsense here. In his second book, Hogan said, that summer of 1991, in front of millions of viewers, not to mention the millions more who would read about it in the papers the next day, Arsenio asked me if I was using anabolic steroids. I said, no, I'm not. I told the truth, but I wasn't being honest. Let me just stop there and say Hulk Hogan is the only person who could say, I told the truth, but I wasn't being honest. I told the truth in so far as I wasn't using anabolic steroids right at that moment. I might have been using them three weeks ago, but I wasn't using them right then. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was playing with words. Oh, you're so smart, Hulk Hogan. Nowadays, Hogan freely admits to being on the juice, but in his second book, Hogan said he quit completely in 1992. To be honest, Hogan did get a lot leaner during this period and he was even more lean when he arrived at WCW, but I'm not so sure if he gave it all up in 1992, particularly if you look at the Hulkster during his 2002 WWE return. Did you know that Hulk Hogan had the ability to alter time? Did you know that Hulk found the secret to adding more days to a calendar year? I'll just read what he wrote in his second book. To really blow your mind, think about this. 
If I say I wrestled 400 days a year, it's no exaggeration. My years were actually longer than 365 days. The American audience had no idea that I was wrestling in Japan during the whole Hulkamania thing. There were times when I'd fly back and forth to Japan twice in a week just to wrestle. I used to complain about driving 9 hours between matches in the Memphis territory. Now it was nothing to wrestle in Madison Square Garden one day, then fly all the way to the Egg Dome in Tokyo on the same day cause you'd gain 14 hours, and then fly back to the west coast and hit San Francisco or LA before getting right back on the plane to fly to Narita International Airport before jumping on another plane to fly back to Boston. So I could wrestle in Japan today and then fly back across the international dateline and land in another town yesterday. I was constantly adding days to my years. A few things to add here, completely ignoring that a Hulk Hogan year is longer than everyone else's year by 35 days brother. According to records we have on the internet, there was never a time Hogan would have to fly back and forth to Japan twice in a week just to wrestle, but I guess it's still possible if he had to come home for some other reason that was unrelated to wrestling in the United States. It just seems very unlikely and also very stupid. It is easy to confirm though that there was never a time that Hogan wrestled in the garden one night and then in the Tokyo Dome the next. That simply didn't happen. Here's one I stumbled upon accidentally while gathering footage of the Hulkster for this very video. Most of you guys will know what MTV Cribs was, but if you didn't know for whatever reason, it was a show that featured celebrities showing us around their homes. I don't know if it's still airing today and I don't care much to check it up either, but Cribs was one of the more interesting shows MTV had to offer during a time when they were slowly phasing out music videos in favour of original shows. During Hogan's episode, the Hulkster showed us a room filled with his own merchandise Dice. He picks up a pair of boots. He says these are the most famous pair of boots he owns because he wore those bad boys when wrestling Andre the Giant. Have a listen. Wrestled Andre the Giant with these boots on, and then a couple days later he passed on. These are my favorite pair of boots. Yeah, Andre the Giant passed on just days after losing to Hulk Hogan. The last time Hogan and Andre were put together in the same bout was during the 1990 Royal Rumble match and even then they weren't in the ring at the same time. The last time Andre wrestled was on the 12th of April 1992 in an All Japan 6 man tag and that tag match didn't feature Hulk Hogan of course. Andre passed away on the 27th of January 1993. We all know Hogan was referring to WrestleMania 3 when he made this ridiculous statement on MTV Cribs, but Andre passed away 6 years after the match in the Pontiac Silverdome. So not only can Hulk Hogan slow down time and make years longer, it appears he can also make them a lot shorter. Eric Bischoff said that convincing Hulk Hogan to turn heel was difficult. Eric said he was all fired up when he paid a visit to the Hulkster's mansion and he dusted off his old salesman hat to pitch a heel turn to one of the biggest babyfaces ever in professional wrestling, if not the biggest. Bischoff said that Hogan was too nice of a guy to say outright that he wasn't buying it. But 5 minutes into the pitch Eric said he knew Hogan just wasn't feeling it and this potential heel turn was going down the toilet fast. The conversation ended early, Hogan says Eric would never understand until he's walked a mile in his red and yellow boots. Thanks for coming by, see you later. This is all on YouTube by the way and it's not hard to look up, but it was also committed to print when Bischoff wrote in his book. He stroked his Fu Manchu. He rested his chin on his hand and continued to stroke his Fu Manchu for what seemed like 20 minutes. Then he said, well brother, until you've walked a mile in my red and yellow boots, you'll never really understand. And with that, he looked at his watch and said, I'm sorry, I've got to pick my kids up at school. He showed me to the door. Let's take a look at Hogan's first book, shall we? And let's see how the Hulkster remembers things. I had talked to Vince McMahon about the idea of me turning heel even before I left. He told me I could never be a bad guy, it just wouldn't work. But still, I had this thought in my mind. So when WCW started floundering a little, I went to Eric Bischoff and I said, Look brother, if I looked at these kids and I said, For years I've been telling you to train, say your prayers and take your vitamins, but guys, I did it for the money. That simple statement would shock the wrestling world, it would turn me into a heel. Eric liked the idea so he ran it by Ted Turner. I don't know how the hell Eric got him to agree to it, but Ted Turner said, ok, give it a shot, just leave yourself an out if it blows up in your face. So we did it.
This one's extremely hard to believe, yet it's one that we can't really prove. Did you know that Owen Hart was on Hogan's side when brother Brett and the Hulkster were having issues backstage? It's hard to believe because we've known for a long time that Brett and Owen were very close. There isn't a single account out there that states Brett and Owen didn't get along, and the only time it's ever been hinted at is right here in Hogan's first book. Again, we can't really prove that what Hogan says here wasn't the truth, but it just doesn't seem right at all. Hulk said, At various times, Bret Hart and I didn't get along. Owen would say, Terry, I think my brother's overreacting. I'm on your side. Back then, I said, We'll keep that between us. I don't want to be the one to drive a wedge between two brothers. But when Bret was having his pissing fits, Owen thought it was ridiculous. On the subject of Bret Hart, Hulk also said this, when both of us wound up in WCW, Brett came up to me and said he overreacted and he was wrong, and I accepted his apology. We became friends after that, and when Bill Goldberg seriously injured him by accidentally kicking him in the head, the only guy Brett would wrestle would be me, because he knew I would be careful not to hurt him. After Brett got kicked in the head by Bill Goldberg, he had 9 matches in WCW between house shows and TV. None of these matches included Hulk Hogan. Believe me when I say, there's more Hulk Hogan nonsense out there and his two books are filled to the brim with exaggerations, embellishments or just flat out lies. And I really hope this doesn't come across as a Hulk Hogan burial brother because, well, he said all these things himself. In saying that, there are some other Hogan stories and things that Hogan apparently said that I simply couldn't find a source for. And through making this video, I 100% believe that people have made up their own little Hulk Hogan quotes and passed them off as something that came from Hogan's mouth. Though you have to consider too that the Hulkster really doesn't do himself any favours either. I get that he and others have lived these lives that are all about working people and making things seem grander than what they actually are. A little fabrication here and a little spin there helps to sell your character and sell tickets. It might bring more people to the arenas and wrestlers are supposed to be more than your average Joe. But Hogan seemed to continue lying long after his days in the ring and the lies are so ridiculous that he's made himself an easy target. Target. The brother will always be an important piece of the wrestling puzzle. You can't talk about the history of pro wrestling without Hulk Hogan's name coming up multiple times, but he's also talked a load of nonsense multiple times. Thanks for watching everyone and take care.